Hey everybody. Welcome back. We are looking into uh, orthogonality now. We we ended uh, before spring break uh, talking a little bit about how we might apply orthogonality in a practical setting. Uh, but I can't remember exactly where we wound up. I know we got through a first, the first few pages of these notes, but I can't remember exactly how much so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and give us a little bit of a recap to refresh us on where we were before we went on break. So uh, if you want to follow along, we're looking at uh, chapter four in uh, Olver and Shakiban. And this will be section 4.1, starting off with why we might even care to use orthogonality in the first place as we uh, carry out practical computations. So, in order to motivate this, remember, we're working in some inner product space, and that inner product space doesn't necessarily have to be finite dimensional. Uh, this vector space V could be an infinite dimensional space. Think, uh, think like function spaces. Those are going to be a really key uh, playing field for us moving forward. So, let's say that we just had some arbitrary basis here, right? We just had an arbitrary basis for this space, and because it's a basis and I have a finite number of elements in it, that means that the vector space is finite dimensional. And we could always, uh, th instead of uh, thinking about the, the, uh, the space that we're working with, with as being uh, infinite dimensional, we can always look to a smaller subspace, right, a finite dimensional subspace, and then work inside of that. Uh, this is actually the case for differential equations, uh, for ODEs specifically. Uh, for the linear theory of ODEs, uh, if you have an nth order uh, ODE, a nth order linear ODE, uh, homogeneous linear ODE, then the solution space is a finite dimensional vector space, right? So that would live inside of the larger infinite dimensional function space, like whatever smooth uh, function space you want, or uh, you can restrict how, how regular you want your solutions. But the point is that we can always look to some finite dimensional subspace and then work there. And if we were to start working in that finite dimensional subspace, then we can go ahead and represent any vector that lives there in terms of this basis, right? In terms of this beta, uh, beta set. And of course, each of those vectors, u and w, is going to get their own set of weights, and those are going to be their beta coordinates in this space. So we can readily compute their inner products if we know the inner products between the basis elements already. Right? We can go ahead and compute this uh, using the bilinearity of the, uh, of the inner product. And that'll wind up giving us this, uh, this relationship down here, that the inner product between u and w is this double sum, right? It is a double sum. I am indexing over i and j here, so be very mindful of the indices. But the point is that I can go ahead and compute the inner product between an arbitrary pair of vectors if I know what the inner products look like between the individual basis vectors, right? But if I were to carry this out for an arbitrary basis, there are a lot of inner products for me to have to compute. Right, and that would be, let's see, I'm doing this as, what would it be, what would it be? I would have to figure out what the inner product is between v1 and v2, or v1 and v1 as well, right, v1 and v3, and so on. I would have to go to v2, v1, but wait, I already know what v1, v2 would be, so I don't have to compute this one. I would still have to compute v2, v3, or v2, 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 v3, and so on. But again, I wouldn't have to do v3 by v1 because I've already taken care of it down here. So that effectively is going to eliminate everything on a super or a sub-diagonal or a, the upper triangular or the lower triangular por uh, portion of a, of a Grom matrix, right? So this v3, v2 would also be taken care of right there. And that's the point, is that I can omit a fair amount of these computations just by using the symmetry in the inner product, which would bring the total number of inner products I would have to compute down to the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n. And Gauss's trick gives us n times n plus 1 over 2 different inner products that I have to compute. So 
not only do I have to figure out these inner products, but I have to do a couple of multiplications thereafter. And those aren't too bad, but I do have to uh, take them into account. So the bottom line is that computing an inner product here would have to take on the order of n squared computations to carry out, which is not terrible. I mean, it's, it's not Gaussian elimination terrible, but it's not that great either. If only there was some way for us to make this work a little more, a little more efficiently. And if we're careful in our choice of our basis elements, our basis vectors, then there might be a way to eliminate a significant number of these dot product or inner product computations that I have to make. And maybe that would make computing the inner product between uh, u and that would be a w, not a v. Maybe there's some choice of basis vectors that I can use that will make it a little more economical to compute the dot product between an arbitrary pair of vectors. And this is exactly what we want to use for our definition of orthogonality. We want to be able to kill off a good portion of those computations. And in fact, if we can kill off not just, uh, or omit, if we can omit not just one, one side of the diagonal, but if we can omit both sides of the diagonal, right, in this Gram matrix, then I can go ahead and just compute n different inner products and not have to worry about uh, any other uh, pairs of vectors or inner products between pairs of vectors that I that I would have to compute. And one way that we can do this is just to assume that we're using a uh, a basis where most of the dot products, most of the inner products between these vectors, are zero. Right, and this would be uh, this would bring the compl uh, complexity down to an order n computation which is significantly better even than the order n squared computation. So, bases where this occurs have a name. And this is what we're gonna to take to be our definition of orthogonality, that uh, a basis from you, uh, basis of our space, uh, of our inner product space, will be orthogonal if each pairwise, uh, each pairwise, uh, each inner product between uh, different vectors in this basis is zero, right? So remember, orthogonality will be the algebraic equivalent of uh, our geometric notion of perpendicular. So these, uh, these inner products will be, or these vectors will be effectively at right angles to one another in a geometric sense. And in particular, if I can go ahead and uh, stipulate even further that the inner product of any vector with itself is one, then I can go ahead and call this basis orthonormal, right? So normal just being, uh, normal just being a, an indicator to say that these are unit vectors, right? At which point we would go ahead and denote these, uh, these vectors with hats instead of just plain old vector notation, or at least that's what the convention I will use will be. Right? And different kinds of orthonormal or orthogonal or orthonormal bases. We have, uh, we have a prototype, right? We want to try to mimic as best as we can what's happening in the standard inner product space, the standard Euclidean inner product space. So these guys technically should have hats on them, right? Because these are our standard basis vectors, right? Where we are, uh, for this guy, we are one in the first component and zero everywhere else. And all the way down to en, which would be one in the last component and zero everywhere else. These guys, you can readily check against the dot product, are not just orthogonal, but they are orthonormal. All the vectors are of unit length. But more, uh, more to the point, there are other examples that are less like these standard bases, or that are not the standard bases, but are still like them. And we look to this new set here sitting in R3. And we can check that this is actually an orthogonal set, right? It's an orthogonal set, and we don't know that it's a basis yet, right? We haven't checked linear independence. We know that we have enough vectors, but we still don't know that it spans R3. 
So we don't know if it's a basis, but we can at least check that this is, on, this is an orthogonal set. So all we have to do, we have to check the, the dot products between these three pairs, right? Uh, with with uh, what, u1 with u2, u1 with u3, and u2 with u3. And all three of these you can check are zero. So indeed, this is an orthogonal set, but it's not orthonormal, right? None of these vectors is of unit length, but that's not too hard for us to figure out. It's not too hard for us to uh, construct. Once we have an orthogonal basis, it's not hard for us to construct an orthonormal basis. In fact, if I just take this vector as an example, uh, it's not unit length, right? The length of this vector, one by two by one, in the standard sense, this is the square root of this vector dotted with itself. Oh, sorry about that. Whoa, what happened there? Okay, this vector dotted with itself, and this would be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared, sitting under a square root. So this is a root 6, so this guy definitely isn't unit length. However, I can go ahead and scale this guy by that by that length, and this will go ahead and get me a unit vector. Whee, there it is, okay. So that is the vector that goes right here. Okay, and I can do that with the remaining two vectors in that, uh, in that set, and I'll wind up with uh, an orthonormal set. Right? So it's not too hard to construct these guys or at least to verify that they are uh, that they are an orthogonal set. And if I'm careful, can I erase that guy without touching anything else? No, probably not. Um, let's see, can I get it from that side? Oh, so close. And, come on, we can do it. Oh, that's okay. Well, we'll just do this and put that back in. Okay, there we go. And we'll come back to page width. No, we'll do, yeah, 100%. There we go. So this is an orthonormal basis, or maybe uh, we, we can see that it's a basis. Uh, we'll see that it's a basis shortly. But uh, these guys are definitely uh, going to make an orthonormal set. And if we change up the dot product on R3, then these different lengths and these different uh, notions of orthogonality will change or the notion of orthogonality will change as, along with the, the lengths of these vectors. And this is what I was getting at earlier, that if we wind up with an orthogonal set of vectors and none of them is the zero vector, then we can definitively say that this is an or this is not just orthogonal, but this is a linearly independent set. So here's, here's the deal. So if I'm looking at this from the R3 perspective, right, I've got x by y by z, then what I'm saying in this theorem is that these standard basis vectors, i, j, and k, right, these are giving, my, giving me my coordinate axes, because these guys are mutually perpendicular to one another, there's no way <clears throat> that these guys can line up in a way to cancel out all directions at the same time in a non-trivial fashion, right? There's no C1 that I can add here, C2 to the J, and C3 onto the K here, that will produce the zero vector unless all three of these guys, all three of these weights, C1, C2, and C3, are zero, right? This is because the vectors are orthogonal. Right, or I can see I can see this uh, lack of uh, dependence in the fact that they are orthogonal, and one way that we can actually go about doing this, one way we can see it, is by say, uh, is by checking like what would happen. Oh, did I kill something? Yep. Uh, one way to check this is to assume that we had the zero combination, right? So we're trying to create the zero vector out of our out of our base our, out of our uh, our set S here. But if we try to do that, notice what happens if we take the dot product or the inner product 
of the left and right hand sides of that relation with respect to any vector, any arbitrary vector in the set, we'll say it's vj for the moment, for some index j, then we can go ahead and impose linearity here, right, in the first component to bring the sum, right, so it distributes the, the uh, inner product will distribute, uh, or will, yeah, will distribute across a sum, and we can go ahead and inside each one of these factor out the ci in the first component. Now, if you're in a complex vector space, you may or may not have to uh, make that a conjugate value as it comes out. Remember, we have conjugate bilinearity in, uh, in complex inner product spaces. But the point is that eventually what I'm going to wind up with is a whole bunch of computations, a whole bunch of inner products against my, ortho against my orthogonal set here. The only terms that survive here, right, because this is the Kronecker delta, right, the only terms that survive are when i actually equals j. So in this case, it turns out that the only term that survives is the j, right? And if we're assuming that none of the vectors in this set are zero, then this guy, this inner product vj with vj, can't be zero, otherwise it would be this, uh, otherwise vj would be the zero vector due to positive definiteness of the inner product. Therefore, that would imply that this cj, uh, the cj weight has to be zero. But this was done arbitrarily. It, it didn't matter which, which vj I used, right? It could have been v1, it could have been vn or sorry, VK, I suppose, that was the number of elements in the set. But it didn't matter which one I used, therefore, this works for all of those indices J, and my CJs all have to vanish. Okay, and that means that the only way for me to create this trivial zero vector with my, with my set S is if all of the weights CI were equal to zero. And that's exactly what it means for the set to be linearly independent. Right? And the last statement here about spanning, uh, about the spanning set, sure, these vectors span their own span, duh, and we've just shown that they're linearly independent. So they're actually an orthogonal basis for their span. And that one I won't discuss any further. There we go. Cool. So last thing we'll talk about uh, for this video is uh, maybe a non-trivial example, something that doesn't quite fit our intuition or it doesn't look like a standard Euclidean vector space. Let's talk about the polynomials of degree up to and including two. And we're gonna do this on the interval from zero to one. So we're, we really are thinking about these guys as functions on that closed interval. And we're giving it the standard L2 inner product. Remember that will look like f bar x times g of x dx in a complex vector space. And in a real vector space, we can just go ahead and bloop, omit that conjugacy. All right, so that is gonna be what we mean by the inner product of f with g, okay? So even though we're uh, going to go ahead and consider the standard monomial basis for this, uh, for this space, this basis is not orthogonal. So even though it's linearly independent, right? So linear, linear independence and orthogonality are not the same concept, right? Our theorem just says that if you are orthogonal, then you are linearly independent, provided nothing uh, in your set is the zero vector. But... In this case, we can actually go ahead and check. The inner product of any pair of these monomials with one another is never zero. Okay, so there's no way this is an orthogonal set. It's far from it. But it is still linearly independent. Okay, so the bottom line here is that orthogonal implies linearly independent. Lin independent. But the other way around is not true. Right, linearly independent does not imply orthogonal. And that's where we're going to go ahead and cut off this video. We'll start next time with the following question. 
of what happens when we try or how we can compute the coordinates of a vector 